All right, I think it's time for us to get started. I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us today. Uh, welcome to the CNCF webinar for today, which is using Envoy Proxy as your gateway to Service Mesh. I'm Mario Loria, a senior DevOps engineer at StockX and a cloud native ambassador. Uh, I'll be moderating the webinar today. Uh, we want to really welcome our presenter, Christian Posa, who's going to be doing most of the work. Uh, he is a global field CTO at Solo.io. Just a couple housekeeping items, and then we'll be on our way. Uh, during the webinar, uh, you're not able to talk. We have everybody muted. Uh, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to drop questions in there, and we will get to as many as we can, uh, both throughout and, and mostly at the end of the presentation. Uh, this is an official webinar of the CNCF. And as such, is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that could be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Uh, please re be respectful to all of your fellow participants and presenters. Uh, with that, I think I'll hand it over to Christian to kick off today's presentation. Thank you very much. Well, let's get going. Um, so we're going to be talking about Envoy Proxy and Service Mesh in this webinar. Now, these are two technologies that have emerged out of the cloud native ecosystem in the last few years. And they, they promise some powerful features and capabilities that, that uh, should help us. Now, we're gonna look in this webinar at some practical ways to adopting this technology and maybe some questions and things to be thinking about as you go down this path yourself. So my name is Christian. I'm a field CTO at solo.io. I've, I've spent a lot of time working with enterprises on modernizing their application infrastructure, on uh, building toward microservices architectures, and overall becoming more successful at delivering code faster and learning from the, the you know, your, your, your a modernization efforts as well as learning from your customers when you get those code changes out there. I've written a few books. I'll, I'll plug one of them in a second. I've been involved in open source for a long time now. Um, spent time at Red Hat, at large banks, at um, uh, internet companies who, you know, 10 years ago were doing and using this technology to to uh, build their services architectures and now they're kind of the poster children for that for the movement. Uh, but although you can't speak, like Mario mentioned right now, the, the lines are muted, do reach out to me at any point um, after the webinar, if you'd like to discuss or debate or compliment, you know, reach out, um, reach out to me anytime. So I wrote the first book on Istio, which is a service mesh, um, almost a couple years ago now. And Currently, I'm writing Istio in action for Manning. And that book is currently in a early access preview. Um, you know, in, in, in full transparency, it kind of stalled a little bit, but I've just recently added a co-author and we'll announce that uh, hopefully next week and uh, hopefully, ho hoping to push to get the, the book finished here. So why you might be interested in these topics, you probably have some experience with technology that connects applications. Uh, but as you go from monolithic style deployment architectures and, ar and uh, application architectures into both cloud infrastructure, and by that I mean infrastructure that is ephemeral and that can elastically scale and can be provisioned on demand. So when we start to build our applications to take advantage of these these infrastructures, we have to think differently about what, you know, what, what, how we build the applications and what the architecture looks like. And, you know, when you go to whether this is your on premise or into your, your public cloud, you want to find technology that allows you to solve some of these challenges around the ephemerality and, and the scaling and, and so forth. You might and probably do already have existing API infrastructure, whether that's API management, whether that's um, enterprise service buses, whether that's messaging queues and so forth. These are the, the, the things in the past that we've used to connect our applications. Um, you might be interested in this because you're going to, in the middle of 
a, a cloud infrastructure adoption, whether that's containers, whether that's public cloud, and so forth. Um, you're finding it challenging in a heterogeneous environment to um, get, a, get insight and collect telemetry about what's happening between the applications as we move to services communicating more over these cloud networks. Um, you know, there, there's, there's more complexity in that interaction and we need to be able to observe it and understand it. And we don't all get to just say we're moving everything to containers and to cloud and you know with a nice greenfield project we have existing investments we have existing infrastructure that's not cloud and we need to be able to solve the problem of uh, some of these applications being in multiple different deployment targets um, and, then, and then ultimately we can't compromise our security by and our security posture by adopting these new technologies and so forth the organizations that I've met with and have seen this over the over the, the few years now that we that I've been helping folks with service mesh, um, what they end up seeing and in, in their, their current deployment architectures look something similar to this, where um, they started off with an API management solution. They were going to build APIs, expose them to their partners, build this API economy, and so forth, and that went slower than they thought. And so what they, what they decided was, well, we're just going to build the APIs internally. And we'll expose those between our business units and so forth. And so we need to solve for things like the connectivity problems, like uh, so, um, security and rate limiting and telemetry collection. What they ended up doing was forcing everything through these centralized gateways. Now, for you know, part, partly, so some, some of that, the, the reason of the centralization, folks are saying we need something to be able to go fast. We need something that is a little bit more cloud friendly. Um, oh, I heard about this service mesh thing. That sounds really interesting. Let's just go all the way. We're just going to uh, try to get rid of the centralization, go all the way over to what, what looks more decentralized, where a uh, service proxy or the data plane gets embedded with the applications and the applications talk to each other through these, um, through these different proxies po point to point, right? So we're not going through a, a centralized bus or a centralized uh, hub and uh, the applications are allowed to, and they're, they're interacting and, and talking with each other directly. Now, this is a, is a reasonable approach. Um, the it doesn't come without its own challenges though so some of the challenges of adopting service mesh are um well do you really need one <laughs> let's start with that so you hear about the service mesh thing your existing api infrastructure might be a little bit more or too centralized where it goes too slow um not not cloud friendly enough and we're going to go to service mesh but do you really need one Service mesh is complex itself. Um, oftentimes you're layering it on top of a cloud infrastructure that you may not fully uh, have mastered. So you have to ask yourself some of these questions before getting started with going down the path of a service mesh. Are you going to realize the value of solving these problems more than you will um, incur the pain and is it worth it? So do you have large deployments? a lot of service to, service, service to service communication, a mix of different languages and frameworks. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're struggling to consistently implement observability at the application layer. And then of course, you know, like I said, if you're gonna adopt uh, of this, this next level of complexity, then make sure that you've squeezed everything out of the existing cloud infrastructure that you've, that you've put in place. Some of the challenges of adopting a service mesh Right now, there's kind of a um, service mesh, you know, each individual vendor is trying to build the one that will win. Um, so which one do you choose? You don't want to pick the wrong one. Who's going to support it? Um, it's, it's very difficult to manage multiple clusters of these things once you start to implement them. They're not always as transparent to your application as you'd like or as um, the 
the creator of the service mesh would like. Um, and once you get it into your environment, who's going to run it? Who's going to own it? And what are the processes that are going to look like on top of it? That's a lot of stuff to try to tackle. And that, similarly with Kubernetes and containers and so forth, will bring a lot of people to the table. And the adoption of this technology, because of that, will not be very quickly. It will be slower and methodical and, and thought out, and, and everyone will have their opinion and so forth. So how do we how do we get there? So if we if we accept the the, the premise that if you do have these problems and uh, the service mesh in a decentralized way nicely solves some of these problems, then how do we get there? And the approach that I've been advocating now for the last few years, and that we've seen successful, is the start small and incrementally adopt new features. Uh, start with a minimal piece of the service mesh and, um, and, and master that and then and start, start going from there. The approach that uh, seems to be fairly comfortable for, for, for most people is starting with something they already understand. Starting with a gateway, starting with a gateway that is suitable for a cloud native um, application and cloud infrastructure. As a service mesh, as we saw in the previous slide, is made up of multiple one of these proxies that end up talking with, it, with each other. Um, it's very, that, that component, that proxy is very important. All of the requests are flowing through that proxy. So when you start, you don't start with 100 of these proxies. You start with one, or you start with two, and you start to understand the technology that makes up that, that data plane proxy and how to operate it, how to debug it, how to pull the logs from it, um, and, and, and so forth. And starting with a gateway approach at the, at the edge or boundary of your architecture, again, like I said, is, is something people are familiar with. They're familiar with that, uh, with that concept. And once you become successful with this, this data plane technology, um, then you can start to roll it out into multiple parts of your, of your application. Now, this starts to kind of hint at the, um, uh, the, the notable differences between the traffic coming into our cluster, which is at the edge, and is what we're talking about here, starting with the edge gateway, some of those, those concerns versus what the, what the service mesh will ulti ultimately help you with, which is the east-west or the service-to-service -service, uh, traffic concerns, right? So if we're looking at this through the lens of, well, if we start with, a, with the edge gateway, the problems that we'll need to solve are how do we get potentially untrusted traffic into our cluster and do that in a way that complements any of the, the service mesh technology we might use for east-west. Now, if you look at um, some of the, uh, the, the functionality in a service mesh, things like traffic control and traffic routing and some of the resiliency aspects for making connections and uh, load balancing and service discovery and circuit breaking and so forth. There is some overlap in those problems that you need to solve at both the edge and within the east-west traffic, within the service-to-service -service communication. And so from that perspective, the north-south and the east-west distinction for some of these challenges will overlap, right? And so we would expect the technology that we pick for the edge and for our, our service mesh to be, be complementary. We, we, we know there's going to be overlap, so we want them to be complementary. However, there are things that you start at the edge that, um, that you do need to solve for traffic coming into the cluster that you may not need to in east-west in the service-to-service -service communication. So it's a different superset of problems at the, at the, at the edge of the boundary of our, of our cluster or deployment unit or architecture, or however we want to describe it. And we'll look in, in, in a little bit about some of these deployment patterns 
and some of these architectural patterns that, uh, um, and, and where to draw the boundaries and so forth in, in, in just a little bit. But uh, the, the concerns at the edge, things like various security, authentication and authorization uh, components, things like an application firewall, web application firewall, uh, maybe some very specific security plugins to tie in and be backwards compatible with your existing investments. Um, something that within your cluster, you know, the east-west traffic might not need to deal with. So that's where Envoy comes in. So we have this, we want to go to a decentralized um, application networking architecture. We want to start iteratively and, um, and, and maybe start at the edge. We want technology that is complementary to both the north-south and east-west traffic. And we know at the edge, we're going to need to solve problems that we might not need to in, in the east-west uh, uh, space. Envoy fits this solution or, or fits this problem space very well. And now Envoy has been talked about a lot recently. It has become very popular for a uh, for multitude of reasons, including the fact that it's been adopted by some large web companies. It is adopted at scale in large production use cases. And, uh, the com and I think most importantly, the community behind it has, has grown uh, very vibrant, very diverse. And um, the, the project is very welcoming of changes and, and so forth. So we have, a, we have a nice thriving community. Envoy is an implementation of a level seven proxy that understands um, how to collect telemetry. It can help with connection load balancing, can help with service discovery and, um, and traffic control and traffic routing and, and so forth. So, and then these are, these are things that we need. These are, these are features that we need whether in a service mesh when talking to other services or at the, at the edge. A logical diagram could look like this, where you have Envoy proxy as a, as a mediator between your traffic and you can do interesting things like route traffic between your, your maybe your monoliths or your various services in the back end and uh, very finally control the, the, the traffic based on versions, based on um, various other, other headers based on potentially even the body of the message. So you can do some very uh, fine grain application routing within Envoy. Um, it's very important that Envoy is collecting this telemetry so that you can understand how many requests are coming through, how many failures, how many circuit breaking events, uh, how, many, how many connections are, are closing and, and so forth. Now, when you, especially if you start to think about Envoy at the edge or the Envoy at the, at the boundary of your architecture, you start to think about decoupling what's running on the upstream side of, or, the, or the right hand side of the proxy versus who's calling into your architecture. You might want to expose services as, as um, JSON over HTTP or REST and your internal services might be talking gRPC so you need some kind of bridge there or the API shape itself uh, that you expose to your users outside of your boundary might be different than uh, the, the, the APIs that are actually being used upstream. And so you need that decoupling point. And so for, for you know, the ability to take Envoy and run it at the edge to give you API decoupling along with traffic shifting and telemetry collection and um, distributed tracing and so on, we at, at Solo, we built an open source product called Glue. Now, Glue is an edge gateway or an API gateway built on Envoy and it runs natively in Kubernetes and implements this API decoupling, um, you know, transformations of, of your requests uh, with, you know, we, we, we saw that slide earlier with the capabilities of solving challenges at the edge. You might need OAuth or you might need some custom authorizations, um, you know, caching and rate limiting and, and these types of things that you would expect from an edge proxy. 
Glue provides um, kind of a, a, a packaging of, uh, of capabilities that, that solve this out of the box. Glue is basically the control plane for Envoy. The control plane was built very specifically to be extensible, to be able to plug in additional capabilities. We didn't try to build a one control plane to rule them all. What we, what we knew coming from our enterprise background that is if somebody's gonna take Envoy and run it in their environment, they're going to need a control plane and they're gonna have a bespoke typical enterprise environment where it doesn't nicely fit into somebody else's, uh, you know, the, the way they imagined the, the control plane to be. So what we said was everything's gonna be plugins. The control plane basically would be a, a loop that loops through various plugins and then ultimately derives and builds the configuration that Envoy needs and leverages Envoy's XDS or its uh, dynamic APIs for, for configuring the proxy at, at runtime. So Glue can support running in Kubernetes, Glue can support running outside of Kubernetes using console as a backend. It can discover services that have been registered in any, any type of uh, service registration catalog and feed that data, those endpoints into, into Envoy. So Glue as an edge gateway is very complementary to Service Mesh and we've helped people adopt Service Mesh incrementally by going through Glue, by going through a single Envoy proxy or you know, a, a small subset of Envoy proxies that uh, solve real value, that um, provide a stepping stone to Service Mesh and ultimately complement the Service Mesh once it gets into, um, into your architecture. So with that, let me jump to a, a quick demo. I'm going to show you what, uh, what Glue kind of looks like. And then the next section, when we get back to it, is, all right, if we're going to start with a gateway, then how does that architecture change when we start to grow the, the architecture, right? Because one thing we don't want is uh, to end up in the, in the centralized gateway model that, that we had before. What we want to do is uh, provide a path to growing this architecture as well as being complementary to a service mesh. So that'll, that'll be the next section, but let's jump into a very, very quick, uh, if, the, if the demo gods will cooperate, a very quick demo here. So the first thing that we're going to take a look at is a, an existing set of services that we have running in our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, you might be familiar with some of these components. They come from the Istio book info demo. And we see the, you know, the product page, which is sort of the edge part of the application, the UI part of the application, which ends up calling back into these various services to serve the, the product page. So we've also deployed uh, Glue. And Glue, like I said, is built on Envoy, uses the Envoy proxy, and builds a control plane, an extensible control plane around, uh, around Envoy. And just to kind of show, so the proxy's here. If we do kubectl, uh, let's just take a look at, uh, at the proxy. If we do that and, and then we say, let's just take a look at what's actually running in that, in that pod, we can see that yes, indeed, this is Envoy and we passed it a, a config. Um, if we were to take a look at that uh, config real quick, uh, let's, let's see, Envoy, we can see we have a envoy.yaml there. We could also uh, take a, a look at that envoy.yaml. And then this, so this is Envoy's configuration. This is in, in YAML format, Envoy's configuration. The, uh, the important parts of it are right here. What we're saying is, for all of the listeners, all of the clusters, all of the endpoints and routes and so forth, get that from the control plane. And in this case, it is, it is the glue control plane. So from here on, we'll take a look at, uh, 
at, at using the proxy itself. Glue has a nice management UI for, for, for Envoy and, and, and for this, this system here. We can take a look at, uh, uh, first we'll come back to this, it looks like an error. Um, we can look at the, uh, the upstream, so in, in Glue we kind of follow the Envoy terminology. Uh, upstreams are the services that we can route traffic to. In, in Glue, an additional capability of Glue is that we can automatically go and discover these upstreams. In this case, we're looking in Kubernetes, but it could be from a different service discovery registry. Maybe you're using console. Maybe you are writing uh, your applications on Amazon and, and you want to pull them from EC2 or Lambda. You can, you can even pull those services directly from Lambda and route traffic to them. Uh, we, when we click on overview, we can see that Envoy has a configuration error. If we click on that, we can say, we can see that there, uh, you know, Glue, Glue's complaining that there isn't any definitions for the, the proxy yet. So what we're going to do is add a route to the, the product page application. So this is one of the ones we saw earlier. It's the product page application. We want to we want to use Glue as the edge gateway to be able to route traffic into uh, the product page so that we could actually see it. Now, a couple things to notice: there is a Glue CTL kind of a convenience CLI that you can use to um, make changes to the routing and and make changes to Glue's configuration in general. All of this configuration is in uh, in in Kubernetes. Oops. So kubectl get virtual service in Glue system. We can see that these are all uh, CRDs, Kubernetes CRDs. So we could uh, use the CRDs directly, but in this in this particular example, we're using the CLI. Um, we're also going to use the CLI to quickly find out what is this this URL to go to. So if we come over here and, and try to hit that, we can see now that we can get to the product page UI, click on normal user. And if you're familiar at all with Istio and some of the demos done around uh, the book info demo, you can see that. All right, well, we use, we don't have Istio installed right now, but we do have Glue installed and we're able to route traffic into the cluster using, uh, using Glue. If we come back here and click on over, we should see that our configuration is a little bit happier because now the port is open. Now we have actual traffic uh, routing rules and uh, we can use it. Now, that's all, that's all good and well, I think. But you know, if we're running application at the edge, some of the things that we need to solve for are, hey, we don't know these applications or the, or the users on the other side of this boundary. We need to challenge them. We need to add some security, uh, custom authorization rules, um, you know, maybe, maybe use OPA or Open Policy Agent to, to do that. But what we're going to do here is we're going to configure Glue to say, if you're trying to come to the product page um, application, then first ex authenticate and authorize yourself. Let's, let's go through an OAuth OIDC flow. And um, once you're authenticated, then you can get through to that. And again, this is, this is Kubernetes CRDs. Um, so you can build the configs and, and implement them as part of a Git uh, style workflow as well for auditing and, and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply this, this YAML. We see that it has been configured. So go back and we'll get that, uh, that URL. Back here. Now, if we go to that, we should be challenged by our OAuth provider, which we which we configured. So now, if I log in, we'll log in with my account. Now we should be taken to our book info page. So this is just setting up the boundary of our of our system, augmenting it with capabilities that you would expect at the edge. Again. This is a, a you know, stepping stone to get to understanding Envoy, operating Envoy in a familiar model. And then from here, we can plug Istio in or we can plug Linkerd in um, and then Glue will play nicely with 
those, uh, those service mesh uh, uh, deployments. So let's come back to our slides. Now there's a few ways in this crawl, walk, run approach to architect or to deploy these, these gateways. And the approach that we've seen as being successful is starting with a single gateway or logical gateway, right? Not, 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 not just one, you, you would probably deploy a, um, a fleet of these, um, but a single layer, a single tier of this gateway that provides the stepping stone. Like you think about this as a Kubernetes cluster, though it doesn't have to be, this is just a generic boundary. If you think about this as a Kubernetes cluster, you can use Envoy or Glue to uh, allow traffic to come in. You have traffic routing, you have telemetry collection, you have distributed tracing and, and so forth to get the traffic into our services. All right, so we start with a single proxy start to become familiar with, with that. Now you might, and so the next few slides here are, are operational and they're context dependent, but you may, you may find that as you scale out that uh, these various services in the back end, they have different SLAs, different uh, isolation requirements, um, different uh, load requirements, and you might find that a multi-tier setup here is, is, is will work uh, more advantageously. So you might say that on the far left of this diagram that these are the tier one services and we kind of want to isolate them from the rest of them. And so we want to have their own uh, set of a group of proxies that handle the tier one services. And then at the edge, the, the first layer, that all that proxy does is some very, very simple L4 um, or, or if it's doing also very simple uh, traffic rules and traffic routing to get to uh, the next level, which will, which will be smarter um, and, and then provide that isolation. Another thing that we, that we see is that when you start to build boundaries or products or domains out of your service architecture, so now, now we're starting to grow our service architecture, that we might want to push these proxies closer to that application boundary and allow that to serve as a decoupling point between the, the services outside the boundary and outside the domain and those running inside it. So if you're familiar at all with the domain driven design concepts of, uh, of a bounded context, this, this applies here where you need some sort of decoupling or anti-corruption layer between the way your services inside the boundary see each other and how they interact with each other and how they interact with the outside world, right? So this is a, this is a, um, a, a common approach to bringing Envoy in incrementally, introducing it to, uh, to services as, as groups. Now, as you start to push this farther down, as you start to build your application architecture and it starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger and so forth, um, you know, the, the, the thinking is, well, if you just use a service mesh and everything can talk to everything, and you know you, you solve you solve some of these problems, but you create a new problem, right? You start to create a um, uh, a an architecture that's very difficult to understand, point to point connections uh, th throughout the architecture, and um, there are ways to 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 mitigate that, and that is by understanding what these boundaries are, and uh, and, and drawing, drawing, um, you know, drawing the lines around these boundaries and forcing the services within these boundaries to communicate through the various uh, uh, you know, decoupling points in the architecture. So now you have a domain, which might be the account set of services, and maybe a domain, which is the claim set of services, and they're interacting uh, internally uh, with, with each other. Maybe they're using a service mesh for that. But then as they cross boundaries, we're going through these, these gateways. Now, again, these are, like I said, this, this, this is fairly context specific, depending on how big your architecture is, uh, depending on you know, how, how messy, I guess, you're, allowed, you're willing to allow it to get, you might want to draw and put some structure into your application architecture and, uh, and these gateways uh, help, 
help to do that. And then as you start to grow and adopt your service mesh as well for those point to point communications, you know, you, you know, the, the rest of your architecture can, um, can, can make use of that. So, um, surprisingly, I usually end up talking a lot more, but it seems like we're quite a, quite a bit ahead of, of time. Um, I do want to leave you with some links here. Actually, let's go to this slide real quick. So I work for a company called solo.io. Solo is a, is a startup that is working closely with, uh, with our customers and with the community to help them adopt this service mesh technology. And we believe starting with a gateway is a very safe and practical approach. Then getting into a service mesh, um, you will find yourself needing to manage the, the complexity of a multi-cluster service mesh deployment. And that's where we have tools like Service Mesh Hub, which will, will help with a multi-cluster, multi-control plane service mesh deployment. And that's irrespective of the mesh that you choose. So we, we also see in the ecosystem in the industry that there is um, fragmentation. There are new service mesh projects starting up every other week. And there are some that have captured a lot of mind share, some that are growing and so forth. So right now we're not trying to pick a winner. What we're trying to say is uh, it doesn't. So pick, pick the one that you feel comfortable with, explore a few of them. But uh, whichever one that is, we will uh, we'll, we'll be able to help you manage once you try to operationalize that service mesh. Um, and then once you have a service mesh in place, that's what we believe enables a wealth of power in your microservices and cloud architecture. We don't adopt Kubernetes. We don't adopt service mesh just because it's the new latest thing. We adopt it because it enables these APIs. It gives us these APIs that we can use to um, manage our, our deployments, manage our traffic, control it, uh, build canary automation on top of it, build chaos experimentation on top of it, and make it so that it's safer to bring changes out into production. And so at Solo, we built tools like uh, Squash, which is a debugger, Autopilot, which is a service mesh um, operator framework, Glue Shot, which is a um, chaos experimentation framework on top of service mesh uh, to, to solve those, uh, those, mo those more real problems of how do we make changes in our, in our application architecture, do it safely, find issues before they happen, and then react to the, the system as it evolves. And so at, at, at Solo, we're looking at this from that's, that's the end game. We want to help people deploy applications safer uh, but then, you know, the, the emerging technology that's, that's coming out and it's coming in, in, into place, we want to help people be successful with that. All right. Okay. So now I'll leave you with some, some links to some of the open source and, and, uh, and some of the projects that we're working on here at Solo. And I definitely thank you for your time. Reach out to, uh, to us at Solo, me directly if you like. And um, I believe we will have time for, for questions. Yeah, uh, thanks, Christian. Um, and like Christian mentioned, um, we do a lot of stuff in open source, um, and it's all using um, building, building with extending um, many of the projects, many of the projects we love in the CNCF. Um, and so we invite you to come play with us here. So to go and check it out. Um, the there's a couple of questions here um, that have come up, and I think um, if we could start with this, um, there is the Two different folks asked the um, question on um, how, why, when would you use Envoy versus Istio? Um, and I think the question is like, you know, what's, what's Envoy, what's a service mesh, and is it different? So um, we have a few of those. So do you mind um, kind yeah. of recapping that? Yeah, definitely. So let me, let me give you the, the, the basic answer. When would you use Envoy and when would you use Istio? So, and we did touch a little bit on that here, but I, but I, I realized that some of this stuff is, uh, um, a little confusing. So Envoy itself is the proxy technology. So a request comes into Envoy and then Envoy can do some, you know, go through its routing table and so forth and it'll send it out, right? Um, Istio is, Istio uses Envoy. Istio provides a control plane for managing Envoy when it's deployed in a service mesh. 
and a service mesh that would become, I think it's, that's it, uh, this one. So in a, in a service mesh where we have an Envoy proxy deployed with each application instance, then an application A talks to application B through this, this proxy. So um, in, in this case, we have lots and lots of proxies because we'll probably have lots of application instances. And then what Istio does is provide the control plane for managing these lots and lots of proxies for lots of different, um, lots of different application instances. Now, if the question is more, when would I use Istio? And less, like what, what was this distinction between the, the, the two proxies? I was hoping to cover that um, here. And the, the question really is, when, when do I use a service mesh? Right, so Istio is an implementation of a service mesh. There are others. Linkerd um, is, is becoming more popular. It's been around as a brand for quite a while and kind of led the, the initial charge around this, this community. Um, console from HashiCorp, they've evolved console from being a service discovery registry um, and, and lookup server to being more of a, uh, starting to fall into this, this realm of service mesh. Uh, we have things like uh, cloud native providers. So uh, Amazon has something called app mesh. Um, app mesh is built on Envoy. Um, console is built on Envoy. Istio is built on Envoy. The folks at Kong, I believe, are building their service mesh on Envoy and so forth. So Envoy has a large uh, percentage of the market share. So you'll you'll see this this question of when do I use one or the other? But the service meshes are using a lot of them are using Envoy. And uh, so if you're going to ask when do I use one proxy versus you know a service mesh deployment, then you kind of have to ask yourself these questions, and then. You know, you have you'll you'll, you'll find that a crawl walk run uh, approach starting in, starting small and growing out from there is uh, is going to be more successful than what we've seen in in with some of our our users in, in the community that uh, um, try to bring an Istio in and uh, it, it ends up being a lot more complicated up, up front for them than it is to get started uh, smaller. Great. Um, another question here is what would drive the coming back to like kind of architecture when you're looking at ingress, ingress and gateways, what would drive the decision on having one versus multiple and when you're setting up a gateway for your environment. So one, one versus multiple, like in, in this type of architecture, I, I, I guess, I mean, I guess the person who asked I think the question, might not be able two, right. To, to answer the question in two ways, right. If you're, if you're doing a multi-tier kind of gateway, or if you have a, if you have a single environment, but are you trying to have like a, you know, uh, failover or HA? Yeah. So you would you would do multi you would do a multi-tier gateway architecture when you and, and the, the the tiers don't I mean so I, I illustrated this here with assuming Envoy. Um, what's likely at least some of the the, the larger organizations that I've uh, that I've worked with, what's likely is that there will be um, a tier outside of the app application level. So there would be maybe a, um, a, a hardware load balancer or something farther up that, that manages traffic at a data center level. And then once that starts to get into the application deployments, then you know you might want more L7 control, more traffic, more, more control over how requests get routed into the applications, how you know you might want to do a canary style release where you have just a percentage of traffic going into certain versions of the application and so forth. So you might have, uh, in, in, in this case where we have uh, Envoy at this particular level, we're able to do very fine grain request level uh, routing. But the reality is you might have a, a multi-tier architecture where Envoy isn't all of the tiers. Great. Um, there is a question here on, can you leverage service mesh capabilities in serverless architecture? Um, so that is a, an interesting question that is still evolving. I think 
what we did see with um, with things like K Native, which leveraged Istio under the covers inside K Native, um, we, we we did see that. Um, now there's there's there, there are still some challenges in doing that because the server or the function. So, so if if you'll allow me to um, talk about functions as a service specifically and not serverless as a whole, but uh, in, in, in terms of a function environment, some of the challenges around that are that, you know, these functions are supposed to come up quick and then they're ephemeral to go away, right? In a, in a service, service mesh environment, the, the proxies that live with the instances of your application, those are expecting to be a little bit longer lived. Um, and so, uh, so some of the challenges that you might see in, in, a, in trying to make that fit is, you know, the, the lambda comes up or the function comes up and the proxy comes up, right? So they both come up at the same time. Now the proxy is sitting waiting to catch up on, all right, what is this, the lay of the land? What are the services I can talk to? What is my configuration and so forth, right? And so that ends up slowing things down quite a bit and then the lamp, the function runs and then the whole thing goes away right and so then it, then it comes back up and does exactly that same thing it's not all that optimal right now um, but i think what we'll see is as the data plane in the service mesh starts to evolve more some pieces moving down farther into the operating system in the kernel and so forth uh, i think we might see better support for a service mesh out of the box being able to um, to live nicely in a function as a service style environment. Right now, I would say you know, that, that, that's still emerging. Okay. Um, let's see. I was scrolling through this. Thanks for all the questions coming in, folks. Um, do, do, do. There was one, um, there's a follow up question to let me. Um, things like, well, you know, going back to like the, the kind of a glue, glue or a gateway um, and a service mesh, the question is, can they, you know, can they coexist together? The, the, the gateway and the service mesh? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, and this is probably a, a kind of a, a, a visual of that. So the gateway, the gateway itself Solves some problems, like 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 we said. So let's come back. Let's come back over here. Solves, oops, slow down. Solves, <clears throat> solves some problems that the service mesh might not necessarily need to solve. Right. So if we look at if we look here, uh, these capabilities, like some of this this custom security, application firewalling, message transformation, these types of things, will be useful at a boundary, but not within the uh, the, the east west traffic. Um, now, if you have a service mesh in place, you're going to need to solve for these edge problems. So right there, you know, the, the gateway and the service mesh are very complementary. In the case of glue specifically, we can plug in glue into Istio, for example, uh, not limited to Istio, but as an example, Istio is mutual TLS. Right, so that as traffic comes into the cluster, goes through the gateway, we apply these pieces of functionality, but then when we forward the traffic into the rest of the service mesh, it's basically a, a peer of, of the mesh, right? It appears as though it's part of the mesh. Um, we could also do things like tie into the mesh's distributed tracing. So a request comes into the gateway, we can generate all of the, you know, the necessary headers and correlation IDs to kick off the distributed tracing and pipe that to the same distributed tracing engine that the service mesh might use. Same thing for telemetry collection and, and, and so forth. So there's a, there's a nice complementary aspect to it in that the gateway at the edge can provide more functionality at the edge than what the service mesh out of the box will provide, as well as when you have the service mesh in place, it will tie in natively with the, with the service mesh and just look like is part of the mesh. Cool. Um, there's a question here on um, some of the functionality within Envoy. Um, what happens if telem so specifically, what happens if the things like telemetry goes down for two minutes? Um, does Envoy have the capability to collect that information in that interval um, and then 
um, be able to kind of have, have that, uh, have those metrics um, once it's back up, telemetry is back so, up. So, yeah, the, the, the Envoy does metrics a, a few different ways. Uh, a very common one is, is using Prometheus. And so with Prometheus, the, the, the Prometheus server is scraping Envoy saying, hey, give me your telemetry now and now and now, right? And then, and it keeps the, the results that it gets in a time series database and allows you to, from there, you can export it uh, you know, much longer um, uh, storage. But so inside of Envoy, Envoy is basically keeping a, a large set of counters and gauges, histograms, these types of things that Prometheus would then be querying. And, you know, if, if Prometheus happens to go down and is not querying and scraping these, these metrics, those counters are still there, right? The, 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 their numbers are probably increasing, um, more number of requests handled, uh, higher number of connections and so forth. And, you know, when, when Prometheus comes back up, it will, it will continue to scrape and it, you know, it, Prometheus might not have, it might have a little gap in its, um, in, in its time series, but, you know, Envoy isn't, uh, you know, trying to store them up and, um, you know, starts to exhaust memory, puts pressure on the memory and so forth. Envoy is just keeping counters like it, like it would be doing, whether Prometheus is watching it or not. Um, it's actually Prometheus that's, that's, that's pulling and, uh, and storing that. So in, in that case, you know, you might have a gap in your, in your, in some of your telemetry, but and it doesn't affect Envoy. Okay. Uh, and one last question. Um, there's a bunch of questions here regarding just, um, you know, uh, comparing and contrast, like specific questions related to like features of proxies. Um, mm -hmm. um, because there are lots of folks in here actually ask questions about they're using, you know, um, Nginx or HA proxy and, you know, why Envoy? Um, so there's a bit of like, uh, if you could answer like the, you know, um, why Envoy's popularity and are there um, kind of what capabilities does it bring to kind of a distributed environment? If you can kind of go through that, I think we'll be able to answer a few different questions that have come in. Sure. So I think the big, the big the reason for why, so I guess there's a couple, but the big reason in my mind for why Envoy is, um, first of all, the, the community is very open, is very vibrant. It's not owned by one single company. Um, you know, it, the, it, the, the technology itself was built to be extended and that's happening even more so now with the support for WebAssembly. So, you know, Envoy's, Envoy's popularity and um, its uptick and, and, and growth and mindshare and so on is, is because of that, is because of, of that community. The, the second part I would say is that Envoy was built from the ground up to be dynamically configured. Um, you don't need hot reloads and, and this type of stuff. Envoy, it's, it's control of internally is, you know, connected to or, or looking to connect to a, an API which can stream configuration changes back and can update in real, in real time in an in a, in a eventually consistent manner, but it is in, in real time. Um, and so, especially in a cloud environment where services are coming and going, endpoints are coming and going, you're scaling, you're scaling back, uh, things are becoming unhealthy and so forth. Your, your configuration policy changes need to be dynamic. Those can be all managed in a, in a, in a more central location where, but they're not in, in the runtime, they're not in the request path. And then those configurations can be uh, pushed to, to Envoy and have Envoy update and, and uh, react to those changes in real time. Um, and so th those, you know, the, the dynamic configuration of the proxy makes it very well suited for cloud deployments and, and dynamic ephemeral uh, infrastructure. And then, you know, the other part is, you know, the people, it's the, it's the community, it's part of the CNCF, nobody owns, not one company that owns it um, and, and is very extensible. So I think those are, those are two really big reasons why, why Envoy, on, why, why Envoy. Awesome. All right. I think that's all the time we have for questions. So I'm going to um, pass the ball back to Mario. 
Awesome. Thank you, Betty. Uh, that's, yep, that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you, uh, everybody, for uh, joining us. Thank you, Christian, uh, for a great presentation and, and Betty for handling questions. Uh, the webinar recording and slides uh, should be available online uh, later today on the, the CNCF website. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, and we really look forward to see you, seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.